Well, you probably don't recognize me. That's my high school graduation picture uh, up there. Uh, I'm Mark Hahn. I'm, uh, I'm blessed to be the president of the Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences, and welcome to our campus. Um, KCU has been a part of the Kansas City medical fabric for 101 years. Uh, we turned 100 last year. And throughout that time, we've graduated over 10,000 physicians. Uh, we've now graduated uh, a little under 1,000 scientists and about 400 bioethicists. As we continue to expand our medical school program, we're opening a second medical school campus in Joplin. But an important part of our curriculum is that of bioethics. The relationship that we have with the Center for Practical Bioethics is long and strong. You know, my background, uh, the faculty probably doesn't believe this, uh, but I used to work for a living. Uh, I'm a physician by training. I'm an anesthesiologist. Uh, I was a former pain medicine specialist and director of the uh, pain medicine and palliative care program at Penn State University's College of Medicine. Uh, I spent almost 10 years uh, as, uh, as faculty there. Uh, Dr. Richard Payne, uh, across the room, he and I would, uh, would lecture together almost a quarter of a century ago. So there's, uh, it's a lot of time. Uh, now, most of the pain I deal with uh, is my own, uh, trying, to manage, <laughs> trying to manage a university. You know, welcome today to our campus. Uh, the, the paths to person-centered planning is a very important topic today. Uh, we're pleased to, um, uh, to host the Joanne Berkeley Bioethics Symposium. Uh, we've done this for a number of years now, and it's an important part of our mission here in Kansas City. Uh, I want to also quickly introduce two, two new members of our team, uh, Dr. Ed O'Connor, our new provost uh, of the university. Dr. O'Connor is in the back with Dr. Roselle. Welcome, Ed. Uh, and Dr. Darren D'Agostino, our new dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine uh, in the back corner there as well. I want you to have uh, a good time on our campus uh, today. Uh, this is going to be an excellent program. And to start it off, let me introduce John Carney, the President and CEO for the Center for Practical Bioethics. John. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Um, we are delighted to be here uh, once again and uh, certainly appreciate your generosity and your hosting, and we are also delighted to know your two new colleagues, uh, hoping to be able to, to work with them as well as we have with everybody else on this campus for a number of years. So um, we will uh, be taking breaks and lunches and that kind of stuff, and those will be announced for you. Um, for those of you that need, a ramp is over here on the left side that will allow you um, access and egress uh, to be able to get in and out of the room. Um, many of you were joined us last night at the symposium excuse me, at the annual dinner, and uh, we're delighted to have you at the symposium today. Um, as you know, I was uh, last night kind of front and center uh, most of the evening. That will not be true today. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Kathy, uh, who we kind of teed up last night, to do, is going to do the heavy lifting today, and she's done a fabulous job of assembling uh, a great group of speakers. Uh, I think for those of us that are come at this more from the clinical side or from the, the provider uh, perspective, we're going to hear a lot about uh, how person-centered care is uh, distinctly different in some respects than patient-centered care. And that subtle distinctions is very important to us as we really begin to, uh, to incorporate what it is that, that people want and need in the course of their care as opposed to what we see as benefiting them. I thought her framing last night of the question about what does it mean 
what do old people need versus what do I need when I become old are two very different ways of asking a very similar question with quite a different perspective. And so I, I welcome our friends from the disability community who will be with us today, who will really be helping us, I think, rethink a lot of the biases and, and attitudes and things like that that we have as professionals. So I am really excited to be able to do this. It is also my, my privilege to um, introduce to you um, Bill and Janet, uh, Bill Berkeley and Janet Dubrava, uh, who are Joanne's son and daughter. Uh, the family has uh, made a significant investment in um, making this, a, uh, this symposium um, an annual event, and we are very grateful for them. Jo I think Janet and, and Bill will uh, come forward and share a little bit about their mom. Uh, Bert is also with us. Um, you want to stand up and wave, Bert? Bert, I think you're celebrating your 94th birthday. Is that right? Coming up here pretty quick, huh? In a, week, in a, month. In a month. In a month. So um, anyway, I'm sure he could tell us uh, a perspective or two about what it means to, to for him to be um, aging in community. So let me turn it over to to Janet and Bill and um, have you guys share a little bit about your mom. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Bill and I want to welcome all of you to the Joanne Berkeley Symposium. As many of you know, Joanne is our mom, and she would be so thrilled and pleased to know how the symposium has made such an attribute to the center. Mom was passionate about end-of-life issues. She felt everyone had the right to die with dignity and without pain. Mom died the way she lived, with grace and with courage, with dignity, and with very little or no pain. And I would have to say that Mom gave us one of the greatest gifts, which was not only to learn how to live, but how to die. And I think about that constantly. And I am thankful for that. So, yeah. Why don't you tell a story about, that you like to tell about mom? Okay, I'll tell this story. We were having a family dinner, and mom was towards the end of her life. And she sat at the end of the dining room, and we were all talking, lots of family. There were probably 12 or 13 of us there. And mom says to us with her arms on the table, I want everybody's attention. And we I kind of looked at her like, oh, my God, we're in trouble. And she said, I don't want to eat anymore. I want you to stop telling me to drink Boost and get all those nutrients, or drink that Ensure, or the custard, I'm not hungry. And if I become hungry, I will let you know. But I think all of us truly understood at that moment, mom was in control, and she really wanted to die the way she wanted to die. And for her, it was a rude awakening for us, but we were happy that she had the courage to tell all of us that. So, Bill, Bill was part of that. Bill was part of that too. <laughs> and I did exactly as she said to do. <laughs> so I want to add my welcome to Janet's. We're really pleased to be here and glad that you're here as part of the Joanne Berkeley Symposium. I also, as Mark did, I want to acknowledge our father, Bert, who had a 64-year love affair with our mother, but he as well shared her, shares her great passion for the center and for the work of the center. So, Bert, you already stood up, but thank you. And also, we have another sister who couldn't be here today, Jane, and she wanted to know she's sorry she couldn't be here. I want to make a couple of acknowledgments, even though John already has. One is to Mark Hahn, who... Uh, in really a very short time, has made such a difference in our community and uh, all that's done here at KCU. He's uh, obviously a great supporter of the center, 
but also has really provided leadership in our community, and we thank you for that, Mark. Also, to Kathy and to John, I thought last night was wonderful. The dialogue you had was really a, a great way to start this conversation, and I know it's continuing today. It was really a, a great evening. So Janet did such a nice job but I, uh, of summarizing mom, but I just want to add my own perspective uh, because she truly loved the Center for Practical Bioethics. It, she believed passionately in the vision and the mission that the center has and talked about it at every opportunity that she had. And uh, for those who knew, know her or knew her, uh, and those of you who didn't, she always wore a button and it said, have you had the talk? And uh, that talk was about end of life issues and the booklet, the caring community, or caring booklet that's out in front. And if you hadn't had the talk, she was going to make sure you had the talk. But it was her way of making sure that people really came uh, forward and dealt with these end of life issues as uh, we learned last night with our awardee. He spent a decade so far trying to get people to acknowledge this, and she was truly a believer. Um, when she learned that she had, she was not going to beat the cancer that she had. Uh, as Janet said, she really took everything that she had learned uh, from the center and through her long, um, long relationship with the work that's being done, and she internalized it. And she truly uh, began leading a life that exemplified everything that, that the center believes in. And she, she, as Janet said so well, she taught us through her life how to deal with death um, on her own terms and what death and dying were to be about. And she was really a, a role model in showing us how to live life in the face of death. And Janet used the words I always use as well, that she did it with great grace and with great dignity. No, and I'm sure that and we know it wasn't always easy for her, and it never is for anyone. Um, I would tell you that she really, as I hope you can tell, cared deeply about these issues of end-of-life care and how we make sure that we support and that we care for the individual and allow them to express their own uniqueness as they go through this very difficult journey. And, um, and it, it, she really believed that everyone need to, needed to find their own path as they, as they went down uh, that very difficult road. I think most importantly, if she were here today, she would thank you, thank you profusely, because um, whether you're a policy person or whether you are a practitioner, what she knows uh, because you're here is that you're a person that cares and that you care about people and helping them at the most difficult part of their life um, um, take that next step. So. Um, she would say thank you profusely, and as we do, I hope you enjoy the day. It is always a wonderful day every year that we've been here. It's really a, a, a great time to sit back and reflect on absolutely critical issues. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Janet. Um, I, I forgot two things, two items that I need to do. Kathy's going to go ahead and come up here. Um, First of all, those of you that are seeking CEs, uh, they are being provided by the, um, by, I believe it's the Kansas City chapter of the American Society for Pain Management Nursing. And um, there is, will be information available to you <clears throat> for those of you that are seeking uh, continuing education. And I am not quite sure that certificates of attendance will be provided unless you give us your information. So for those of you that need certificates of attendance and not seeking the nursing credit, we will still need to know your name, address, and all that kind of stuff so we can get you a certificate of attendance. And the second thing I want to mention is this is being uh, streamed live on Facebook. So there are folks outside of the, the center. So those of you that are speaking, if you'll make sure that you use the microphones, uh, speak solely, and, and Matthew will try to capture you. Uh, Mark has a tendency to wander. And um, so if you, but if you can kind of stay stationary, it'll be a little bit easier for us to, to capture um, your remarks. And uh, if there are questions from the audience, we just simply will uh, make sure that we repeat them uh, for the benefit of the folks that are not with us on, on live. And then finally, <clears throat> I wanted to 
do an acknowledgement to Bert. He came up to me last night and he said, so I need a little bit better understanding of how the center's Berkeley Symposium, Joanne Berkeley Symposium, is really getting to a national audience. And how are we making sure that we take this to, a, to an, a, the next level? And I said, well, we're working on it, and, it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a task. But a lot of the work that we've been doing this year is really trying to make our information and resources more accessible to those folks who are not in this room. And for those of you that come from the... Um, the area of, of persons with disabilities, you know how important this is in terms of the resources that we need to make available to people in their homes, <clears throat> and in many cases, for the, re the support that caregivers need in order for them to be able to receive those resources when they don't have the freedom to pick up and walk out the door and spend a day in an audience like this. So we've got to figure out, we've got to get smarter about how to do this, and that's one of the reasons that, that Kathy has joined our team. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to her, and uh, we'll begin the day. Thank you, John. I promise not to move too quickly for the camera <laughs> as I limp around up here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us last night. If you were there, uh, my job is to provide a brief introduction of a wonderful panel that we'll have starting in a few minutes and run the, run the mouse at the same time. So I wanted to give you a, a sense of my approach. I've been responsible for putting together the day, so I want to thank all the people who've come to speak and join us uh, at the front of the room today, but all of you who've come as well. And I wanted to tell you why this, why I thought this was the conversation that we needed to have. Uh, but I first wanted to uh, do a short tribute to my friend and colleague, Jamie Kendall. Uh, Tina knew. Uh, Tina knew Jamie. Did anybody else here know Jamie? Did any of you all on the, my, some of my disability friends on the back? Yeah. So uh, Jamie was a woman that I worked with who uh, became a mentor to me. Uh, she had a disability called osteogenesis imperfecta, which meant she was very short in stature. She used a uh, tricked out scooter. Always had a lot of bling on it. She always had cool shoes, three bags. Uh, she was her own sort of dynamo uh, person. And I used to have long conversations with Jamie about how we bridge end-of-life issues between the aging and disability community and do it competently. Uh, so we don't stigmatize, for example, people who live with a ventilator. Something like a wheelchair can be liberating for people with disabilities that can be seen as, seen as limiting for older people. So how do you talk about what people need? And I'm absolutely convinced that some of the, the principles in the disability world about nothing about us without us, we want to be in charge forever, are applicable to all populations. And that there's some things that we've learned uh, in the disability framework that help us make that bridge. So these are the conversations I had with Jamie. And she placed a lot of confidence in me. And she said, if anybody can do this, I think you can. So um, Jamie's with me today, helping me uh, in that bridge. Uh, Jamie, about a year and a half ago, went to the hospital for a voluntary endoscope, uh, had a cardiac event in the hospital during the endoscope, and died. And most of, I knew she was in the hospital, most of my staff did not know she was in the hospital. And I came back to the office with staff in tears in the hallway. She was really much beloved um, by all of us at ACL. And all of us talked universally about how much she taught us. Uh, we, in, in working kind of across aging and disability, just feel very strongly, and this is sort of my credo as well, that every person should be able to make choices and control their own decisions, regardless of their age, disability, or illness. In 2014, we co-sponsored an event with the Center for Practical Bioethics and ACL in Washington. And it was impressive the number of people we got from HHS all across the Department of Health and Human Services who came to have this conversation. At the end of that, HHS formed an internal working group to continue to talk about advanced illness, illness palliative care. That group continues. We were leading it until at some point CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, said we'd really like to be in the lead, which is fabulous because they, they're the major payers and funders. So currently CMS is leading that effort. ACL uh, continued to do this work, and we never were very comfortable in going public because it's so tricky to not do it incorrectly, to do it right, to talk about these issues with the right language. And I never sent anything out talking about people with disabilities unless Jamie read it. I mean, she was sort of the backstop for me. So we started working on principles, and some of the 
people on the ACL staff starting doing interviews with all kinds of different people with disabilities, older people saying, what do you want? What's the right approach for advanced illness and end-of-life care? Uh, ACL, after I left, because I left in July, released draft principles. And if you look at those draft principles, which are longer than the ones I have here today, you will see that what they're saying now nationally, I'm continuing in a conversation with you locally, that these things are all connected, that people should receive full information about their health, that person-centered planning and principles and practices should guide health and long-term services, that ad advanced planning and decision-making should occur early, that all parties should presume that people with perceived cognitive communication impairments or intellectual disabilities are able to make their own decisions. This is huge, to talk about people with cognitive impairment. This afternoon, we will focus specifically on people living with Alzheimer's disease and how you support people with cognitive impairment. That supported decision-making principles are important. That's what Tina's going to start off with this morning after we do our panel. That everyone needs access to services, and people should have access to palliative care. These are the principles that we were working on that are very much in line with the work we do at the center and why I thought this was a great place for me to come live uh, because this is another opportunity to continue to advance this work. Um, I'm gonna, they're taking feedback right now, so if you actually want to look at these uh, online, you can look. We can send you the link if that would be helpful. But ACL is looking for comment from the broader community about the principles, because that will drive their work, their policy work. I don't know how it will drive their funding, but it could drive their funding in the future as they uh, continue to advance these person-centered kind of plans and thinking and approach. So that's kind of my framework starting in the day. I feel very strongly that if we are going to talk about people, uh, consumers, people with disabilities of all ages, that we should start by hearing from people with disabilities first. And so in this first panel, I have reached out to old friends and new and asked them to come talk to us about their lives and their experience with health care. Not necessarily advanced illness or end of life, we certainly will get to that this afternoon, but their experiences in the health care system, both good and bad, and how, as people with disabilities, uh, that has kind of impact, impacted their life. So y'all come on down.